Hi, I'm Mark. Today we're reading from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. Hey everybody, good morning and uh, welcome to Christ Community Chapel. Really glad that you are here, that you're a part of this church. Welcome those of you at our East service, those of you who are tuning in online. Welcome. All right, before I get into the message, I have to give you an update on something that happened here at church uh, this past Friday. We had our first ever uh, adoption foster care fundraising gala. You know, we uh, here at CCC, we love adoption because we feel like God loves adoption. It's just a great image of redemption from beginning to end. And so we have had an adoption fund for a number of years to help families uh, adopt so that the cost is not so prohibitive. And so this is the first time we had this fundraising gala, though. And I love, love, love the way you all respond when you feel like God is doing something. And uh, that's the way you responded this past Friday night. So I give you the total that was raised for adoption and uh, foster care was $204,000 this last Friday. Yeah. It's incredible. I love that. And 10% of that we're going to give to uh, Akron Pregnancy Services because we feel like that's where the story of redemption begins. All right. But thanks so much for being uh, this kind of a church. All right, we are continuing in our series on James. This is week seven of 10. And uh, last week, we covered the second half of chapter three, where James tells us if we are going to process all of life in a way that brings us joy, if we're going to process the words we speak and the words we hear as nourishment and not poison to our souls, the thing we'll need is wisdom. That was last week. This week, he goes in chapter 4, and we're going to cover all of chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 4. If you're going to use one of our Bibles, it's page 951 in one of our Bibles. 
All right, uh, I figured out, I think, why some people love James and others are not so fond of James. And the reason is because James is like a really good doctor with terrible bedside manner, <laughs> right? He's the kind of doctor, if you go to see uh, your doctor and you're getting ready to get on the scale, and if you're like me, you're kicking off your shoes, and trying to empty your pockets, and, and the doctor just goes, hey, muffin man, just get on the scale. It's not going to help. I had a doctor like that uh, one time when I was 31. I went in to get my knee cleaned up. I went to an orthopedic surgeon. And after he examined me, he said this. He said, listen, guys like you never listen. You are a chronic knee abuser. And he said, you're going to keep on doing what you're doing, and I'll tell you what's going to happen. By the time you're 35, I'll give you your first knee replacement. And then when you're 45, I'm going to give you another. And he was like, rrr, rrr, right? And he handled me exactly right. You know, sometimes we need a doctor like that. Sometimes we need somebody like James. So in uh, the 17 verses of James chapter 4, I'm going to try to pull out uh, these three things. Dr. James giving us the symptoms, uh, the disease, and the cure. The symptoms, the disease, and the cure. First, the symptoms. If you go to see your doctor and they begin to go through that list of saying, hey, uh, this, they, they describe something and you're just supposed to say yes or no. Yes, you have that symptom. No, you don't. Very foolish to lie to your doctor, right? Because if you lie about your symptoms, then your doctor will not know uh, how to help and how to treat. It's the same thing with spiritual things. So I'm going to list out some of the symptoms that James puts in chapter 4, and you have to decide inside of yourself whether these are true of you or not. Okay, verse 1, he starts out with quarrels and fights, Quarrels and fights. Now think through your relationships with your family and with friends or with neighbors or coworkers, whatever. Are you the kind of person that you have a lot of arguments? That, that you're the kind of person maybe that can see something and there, there are 10 positive things, but there's one thing that's kind of negative and you just like to poke at that to get a response. And if you are somebody right now and you're thinking, well, I never start fights. You may be one that never starts them, but you are a person that never walks away from one either. So you have to think through whether you are a person that is involved in just a lot of arguments and unrest and conflict in relationships. All right, the second thing is he says in verse 2, he says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. Okay, that escalated quickly. All right, that <laughs> got out of hand. But right, if... Uh, what he's saying there, I, I have to believe he's not talking about physical murder. That would be a very small audience. He's talking about figuratively murdering someone. You know, I've told you before, I get emails. And I don't want to mislead you. The vast majority of emails that I get are positive and encouraging. And I'm very, very thankful for that. And if you are one that has sent those, that's great. Keep them coming. Uh, but I do get some negative emails sometimes. And I got this email uh, one month into my sabbatical uh, when uh, last year the elders gave me a sabbatical to kind of get rest and restore and get refreshed. And one month in, uh, I this hit my inbox. You are the laziest self-indulgent person. You never preach. Chuck Smith preached on a Sunday with stage four cancer on oxygen and died the following Saturday. You are a condemned, spoiled man. Give your salary back. You don't deserve it. Hey, that's, that's a little harsh. <laughs> that's not just harsh. That's violent, right? Here, but here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. It would have been just as violent if he hadn't sent that to me and just said it to someone else. If he had just said to somebody, Pastor Joe never preaches. What are we paying him for? Right? I mean, Chuck Smith preached on stage four cancer. I think he's spoiled. You see how much different that feels? So I can either hold this up and just say, oh, this is so, such a terrible email, or I can kind of go through what I say about people. Here we are in election season, right? What I say about politicians, what you say, what you post or repost. Now, I didn't say it. They said it for me, right? And my quiet time every morning, that's one of the things I go through is what I said the day before. And so many times that ends up, me needing to apologize or confess 
because of the violence that I've done to people without them even knowing it. So how are you doing with murder? Right? The next thing he says in verse 2, verse 3, is you have, oh, verse 2, uh, is coveting. You covet and cannot obtain. Covet means to uh, want something that you don't have. <laughs> right? How hard is that in Hudson? Right? Uh, how hard is that on social media when you're looking at the highlight reel of your friends or your coworkers? Right? Coveting. Then he moves on to adultery. He, sa- he calls us adulterous people. Well, that's really cheating on God anytime that we love anything more than God. But we'll get to that in a minute. And then verse 11, <clears throat> verse 11 he says, do not speak evil against one another. Now, let me just get a little specific with that. I think that is judging the intent of someone's heart. And we do that a lot, I think. Like somebody walks by you without saying hi, and you say, man, what an, what an arrogant person. What you're doing is you're, you're reading into what the intent of their heart is when you don't know. Uh, I was driving the other day, and I was stuck you know, in a line. There was um, construction or something. But there was a turn lane you know, next to me, and I watched somebody you know, race up the turn lane and then force their way into the line. I hate that, right? <laughs> Everybody hates that except for those of you who do that, right? <laughs> and I was thinking about this sermon, but I immediately was just going, what a jerk. You know, he thinks that his time is more valuable than anybody else's. And then I stopped and I thought, wait, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a really, really nice person who has some kind of an emergency at home. They've got to call and they're panicky because of this traffic and they're trying to get to a loved one. What? I hardly ever read into the intent of somebody's heart in a positive way. And you might be like me. And what James says is that's indicative of something wrong. It's a symptom of something wrong inside. And then he talks about judging each other. That is a great pastime. To judge somebody else is is one of the ways that I can feel better about myself without raising a a finger to get better myself. Right? It's amazing. Okay, so those are the beginning symptoms. Uh, How are you doing? There's a movie, uh, an old Clint Eastwood movie called The Outlaw Josie Wales. And in that movie, uh, one of the characters says about Clint Eastwood, he's not a hard man to track, he leaves dead people wherever he goes, right? Sometimes I feel like that's me. When I go through a day and I look back at the wake that I've left, and I find that what James describes is what I have done to people in relationships, and maybe you're the same. All right, so James starts out with a bunch of symptoms. How are you doing with those? And then he moves to uh, the disease, And he actually gives us a disease and then the disease beneath the disease. Uh, First, the disease, uh, verse 6, he says this. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the the proud. Pride is a spiritual disease. Spiritual pride is the number one disease in any church, including ours. And the reason is because spiritual pride is very easy to catch. Very easy to catch. It's uh, very hard to treat, and it's deadly. Right? One of the reasons it's, it's so easy to catch is, one, you don't need a lot of pride. You don't, uh, like, self-righteousness. You don't need a lot of it. You just need a pinch And one of the reasons that it's easy to catch is just this. You're better than some people. That's just true. Like, everybody's not the same. You're better than some people. Right? You sin less than some people. You you give more than some people. Right? When I said you sin, the thing that made me laugh is I was going to say, you sin less than maybe somebody sitting right close to you. Right? It's true. Right? You, you are better than some people, right? You, you can compare yourself. But, you know, here's the thing, though, that the Bible never said, oh, wait, I was going to tell you this. Dizzy Dean, uh, the great pitcher, he said, it ain't bragging if you can do it. Like, one of the problems with spiritual pride is it's, it feels like you're just being honest. You're just being honest. 
And in one way, you are, because you are better than some people. But the Bible is very clear that that we should never compare ourselves with each other. If I'm going to compare myself to anybody, I'm supposed to compare myself to Jesus. And I never compare myself to Jesus and walk away with spiritual pride. It's easy to catch, very hard to treat, because it, when, you're, when you have spiritual, or when you have, uh, spiritual pride, uh, then you, uh, you, you have kind of a spiritual vertigo. Uh, you feel like you're getting close, that you're close to God. Uh, you feel like you're going up when you're going down. You feel like you're getting close when you're getting further away. It's super hard to treat because it'll feel like someone's killing you, which we'll get to in a minute. You know, uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was maybe uh, one of the greatest uh, theologians that America ever produced. And he lived back in the early 1700s, and he wrote a book called On Revival. And he lists out uh, kind of... Uh, some characteristics of spiritual pride, and this is a way that you can self-diagnose. So let me read these to you, and you can decide whether you have any of these. Uh, Spiritual pride makes you more aware of others' faults than you are of your own. Okay. Uh, When you talk about others' faults, you do it with contempt and not grief. I find when I talk about someone's faults who I love— my heart always breaks. When I talk about someone's faults who I don't love, I get kind of a, a weird good feeling, right? Uh, three, you separate yourself from people you have criticized or who have criticized you. Number four, people with spiritual pride are dogmatic about every point of belief. They have a hard time distinguishing between major and minor issues. Everything is a major issue. And five, a spiritually proud person is unhappy. They're always feeling ignored or like they're not being paid attention to. So (laughs) that's one of those tests where I feel like if three out of five apply to you, you've got it, right? It's very, very hard to avoid spiritual pride. And what James says is that is the disease that causes these symptoms that are breaking your life apart and breaking relationships apart. But then James says there's a sin beneath the sin. In verse 2, James says this, you desire and you do not have. That word desire is the Greek word epithumia. And if you've been around for a while, you've heard me use that word before. Uh, In Greek, thumia is the word for desire. Epi is a prefix for over. It means to want something too much. It's usually a good thing, but it's something that you suddenly kind of decide, this is what I really need to make life worth living. This is what gives me value, an epithumia. And it's very, very difficult to determine if you have an epithumia when things are going well in your life because it's hard to discern your own heart. Usually there has to be a crisis, which is why I think James moves right to prayer In verse 3, and he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend on your own passions. Have you ever prayed a prayer like this or wanted to pray a prayer like this? Where you're ready to say to God, God, if you will just do this one thing, if you will answer this one prayer, I'll never ask for another thing. Do you hear what you're saying? You're saying to God, God, if you give me this one thing, I'll never bother you again because I won't need you. I will have everything I really want and everything I need. Do you know how that must make God feel? To have us ask him to give us something to replace him with? That's that's terrible. What James says is that's the beginning. That's the disease beneath the disease Listen, if you are wanting something other than Jesus to be the most important thing in your life, then you don't have another option than to be self-righteous. If you are not depending on Jesus' righteousness, then you have to depend on your own. All right, so those are the symptoms. Those are diseases. Now let's look at the cure because we need to because otherwise this sermon is a real downer. All right, here's the cure that... Uh, James points to. He actually tells us 
uh, two things we have to understand uh, if we're ever going to be cured deep down in our souls. The first thing is we have to understand the enormity of God's love. The enormity of God's love. Look at what James says in verses 4 and 5. He says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? I told you James has a terrible bedside manner, but what he's trying to tell us there is pretty amazing. What he, what he says, what he's saying when he, when he likens God's love or he brings adultery and then jealousy into describing how God feels about us, He's telling us something about the depth of God's love for us. Scripture is very consistent. It doesn't describe God's love for you like a, like a king, a benevolent king's love for his subjects. The Bible describes God's love for you uh, like a, the passion of a husband desperately in love with his wife. Which is why in the Old Testament, whenever Israel would run away from God to worship another God, the prophets didn't just call that idolatry, they called it adultery because they were saying, you're not just breaking the law of God, you're breaking the heart of God. And then James brings jealousy. And you know, if you're ever watching a movie and uh, there's like a man and a woman and they're just, that romantic spark is just starting and the woman turns to the man and she says playfully, wait, you're jealous, right? She says that because she recognizes that she is capturing his heart. When James says what he says, what he's saying is this, that the God of the universe, the source of all love, the headwaters of love has directed that love at you, at you so much so that you have the power to make the God of the universe jealous because he loves you so. Listen, the secret of real security, of feeling secure in yourself, to being whole, to being healthy, is always connected to love. How much you feel loved. I was out in the atrium last week, and somebody came up to me and they said, hey, you haven't shown a picture of your grandson Ezekiel lately. You need to do that. That's all the encouragement I need. So uh, here's a picture of my grandson, Ezekiel, with his mom, Rebecca. And uh, what I want you to see is right now, Ezekiel is just basking in the love of his mom and dad. They are just flowing love into him. And he is absolutely secure in that love. He doesn't worry about what he's wearing, uh, if he's wearing anything at all, right? He doesn't worry about what he can do or can't do because he is absolutely secure in that love. Now, Ezekiel's going to outgrow that love, and that sounds sad, but Becca and Sean don't have enough love. He will need more than what they can give. We all do. There is only one being in the world that can fill you with the love that you really need. And the God of the universe, the source of all love, the headwaters of love, points at you and says, I love you. That's the first thing. The second thing that James says that we have to understand is the the basic principle on which the universe is built. That if if you move against this principle, you are moving against the current, the way God created the world to make. And what will happen is the more you move against this principle, the more you will feel your life breaking up and the people around you, your relationships breaking up. It's the only way for you to experience what James says is peace, what the Hebrews would call shalom, wholeness. You ready? This is the principle. My life for yours. My life for yours. Not your life for for mine. All the world says, no, no, live so that people will serve you. People will pay attention to you. You will have the power. Then Jesus comes along and Jesus says, watch me. And he goes to the cross and dies for you. And what he's saying is, this is the way we made the world. 
Because the only way to really get life is to give your life away. Jesus would say, he who wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What's he saying? He's saying in a hundred different ways every day. You have to find a way to serve, to give, to be about someone else and not yourself. The moment you turn inward is the moment you begin to break apart. There's a a story I think I've told you before about a man who had a dream, and in that dream he went to hell. And in hell he saw this amazing banquet table with all this exquisite food. And everybody there was miserable. They were yelling at each other. They were crying. They were, uh, they were just angry, everything. And the reason was because uh, instead of their hands, they had three-foot-long forks, and they couldn't get the food into their mouths, so they were all starving. Then the guy went to heaven in his dream. And in, in heaven, the banquet table was the exact same. The same exquisite food. Everybody there was laughing and enjoying each other and full of joy. And uh, they had the same three-foot-long forks on their hands. But instead of trying to feed themselves, they were feeding the people across from them. Difference between heaven and hell. Listen, every time you go anywhere and you're trying to say, this should be about me. Even if you come to church and you say, the worship should please me. This should be for me. You are moving in a principle of hell, not heaven. What James says is there are two things you must know, right? If you are going to be spiritually healthy, he goes, spends most of chapter four talking about symptoms and disease, but he does point us to the cure. He says, if you're ever going to be healthy spiritually, if you're ever going to be whole, if you're ever going to heal the relationships around you, You need to understand the enormity of God's love for you. And then you have to begin living in accordance with the very principle of the universe. Because Jesus gave his life for you, you can give your life away to others. And the more we find ways to give our lives away, the more life we will actually have. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I come to you, and uh, you know, uh, James uh, wipes me out sometimes. And uh, I I know I need James. I know we all need James. Uh, I pray for all of us that we'll be honest about our symptoms, honest about the disease, but more than anything, I pray that everybody here will walk away from this service, being reminded of the enormity of your love and committed to to living life the way you want us to live, where we say to others, my life for yours, not your life for mine. Give us opportunities even today to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.